So tonight's passage is from Matthew, chapter 16, verses 24, to chapter 17, verses 13. Please follow along with me in your handouts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. After six days, Jesus talked with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciple asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Thanks, Brandon. Hi, everyone. Uh, It's great to be with you and great to be able to share with you from the Bible tonight. My name's Rob, and I'm part of the staff team that works uh, together with the Christian Union and the Christian Union leaders as uh, CU pursues its aims. And uh, one of the things that uh, I do as part of that is um, teach the Bible, so I'm really just delighted to be here with you and be able to share with you from Matthew's Gospel tonight. Each week at the Christian Union, we read from the Bible because we believe it's God's Word, and we believe that God's word changes lives, that this is uh, the, the means that God uses actually to bring people to faith in Jesus and to transform us. And so it's good for everyone to hear, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, that this is a good thing for us to do together. And we try to read the Bible usually sequentially, that is uh, one passage after another. And at the moment we're reading through Matthew's gospel, that is his biography of Jesus. And uh, as you can see here, we're in the middle of, we're up to chapter 17 now. So last week we looked at the end of chapter 16 this week uh, with a bit of overlap starting into chapter 17. And our series is called The Astonishing Jesus, The Astonishing Jesus, because the Jesus that we discover in the Gospels, including in the Gospel of Matthew, is mind-bendingly, gut-wrenchingly, heartbreakingly and face meltingly astonishing. He is astonishing. And one of the astonishing things about Jesus that I want you to see uh, is that he is amazingly strong and incredibly weak. Amazingly strong and incredibly weak. We're going to see that as as we look at this passage tonight. But uh, we see it throughout the Gospels. And you may, if you have some familiar, familiarity with the Bible, uh, you may have read them and noticed this, or you might not have noticed it, actually. But let me just point out a couple of things to you. From Matthew chapter 8, a couple of things that happen. Jesus and his disciples are in a boat, and a storm comes up, and Jesus stands up, and he rebukes the storm, and the storm stops. 
That is incredibly strong. What was Jesus doing before he told the storm to stop? Sleeping. He was tired. That doesn't sound that strong to me. Earlier in the same chapter, chapter 8, a centurion, a Roman soldier, comes to Jesus and says, Please heal my servant who is really sick, but if you don't have to come to my house, uh, you just say the word and he will be healed. And Jesus does what he says. Heals the man, heals the servant at a distance. That's pretty impressively strong. What happens when Jesus hears the centurion say to him, uh, look, you don't have to come to my house. You, you could do it from a distance. Because I'm a soldier. I'm a person with authority. I tell other soldiers what to do and they do it. So you can tell this disease what to do and who can do it. And what is Jesus' reaction? Anyone remember? He is amazed. Jesus is amazed. Now, amazement is for people who don't know stuff, isn't it? Jesus was surprised. That's not very strong. That's kind of weird. Let me give you another example. John chapter 4. Jesus is at a well in a, in a, a town of Samaria, and he has a conversation with a woman from that town, and he tells her all about her life. He's never met her before, but he tells her that she has been married five times, and the man that she's been with now is not her husband. She is impressed, because that is incredibly powerful, isn't it? Why was Jesus at the well? John says, because he was tired from his journey. That's weak. That's weak. And again and again, we see Jesus both strong and weak. And I mean strong and weak in a broad sense. We see his strength in terms of his power, his authority, his might, his majesty. And we see his weakness. We see that he's vulnerable and ignorant uh, and weak in ways that actually are quite familiar to us. We see Jesus' power in ways that are unfamiliar to us. And we see Jesus' Weakness in ways that are all too familiar to us. How do we understand that? One of the things that Christians have said about Jesus, and I think that this is true, as they've read the Bible, we, uh, Christians have realised that Jesus is both fully God and fully human. The writer of the Hebrews, for example, says that Jesus was like us in every way except for sin. Jesus was like us in every way except for sin. And, of course, the Bible says that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is God. He was with God in the beginning. He was God. And so what do we do with that? That actually is helpful and provides some clues for us. But does that lead us to read the Bible in a way that leads us to this? Sometimes Jesus is having a bit of a God moment. And then other times he's having a human moment. Is that, is that what's going on? He was in the boat asleep, human mode. He realises he needs to calm the storm. He flicks the switch, divine mode, God mode. Is that, is that how to read the Bible? Is that what's going on there? Well, this is, I think this is worth investigating. It's, it's, it is astonishing what goes on with Jesus, just how strong he is and just how weak he is as well. And let's grapple with that by reading this passage tonight, which I think provides some clues for us and helps us to understand these things. So last week, we, uh, Jesus had said some very significant, important things to his followers. He had told them, uh, or agreed with them, that, Je- that about who Jesus actually is. He's the Messiah. He's God's saviour king. That was Jesus' identity. And then what was Jesus going to do as Messiah, as saviour king? He was going to go to Jerusalem and be rejected and suffer and die and then be raised again. There was a kind of job description, a kind of plan for Jesus to follow in order to be the the king. And so you had Jesus, the king, strong, and Jesus, who was going to suffer and die, weak. And then we heard what it's going to therefore mean if you want to be a follower of Jesus, this saviour king. To be a follower of his means to take up your cross, to deny yourself, 
to give up your life for the sake of others, for the sake of Jesus in particular. That's the calling of what it means to follow Jesus. And as someone said, that was a heavy message last week. That was a heavy word. Uh, And Jesus finished it off by saying that the Son of Man was going to come in glory. There was a warning at the end about Jesus himself that he would come in the Father's glory to judge. Okay, so Jesus said very significant things about himself that we need to keep in mind as we then read the next incident. So what Jesus does is he uh, chooses just three of the disciples, the kind of like the inner circle, Peter and James and John, and he takes them on a hike. They go up a mountain together, and Matthew tells us what happened next. And I think what happens next actually, in some ways, sort of, it vindicates what Jesus is saying. It, it, it authenticates that what Jesus says is true. In some ways, there's some kind of endorsement going on here. Three, three things, uh, several things that affirm that Jesus really is who he says he is. So what I want you to do is to read this, uh, read these verses with the person next to you, verses 2 to 5 of chapter 17. Read them with the person next to you. In what ways, what happens in these verses and in what ways is Jesus affirmed? Okay, go for it. All right, so what's one of the things that happens? Up there on the mountain? He's he's transfigured. Uh, It says Jesus is transfigured. What does that mean? Uh, He's transformed as this kind of bright light. Okay, so he's transformed and it's the experience for the disciples is like just super bright light. It's gl- glorious and it's like no one you've ever seen. Right, not even on a detergent ad or whatever. Like, it's, it's a human being who's blinding in their greatness and glory. Okay, And this word transfigures, just, it's actually the word metam- metamorphed, right? He's metamorphed, he's just transformed in front of them. Yeah. Okay. And so here is something about Jesus being revealed to them. Jesus has already spoken about how the Son of Man is going to come in glory, the Father's glory. So that gives us a clue here. What's going on here? Jesus is being glorified. All right. This is not something that he does to himself. This is not a look what I can do moment. You, I bet you didn't know I could do this. He's not saying that. This is something that happens to Jesus. This is something that God the Father does, sharing his glory with Jesus, just as Jesus has spoken about. Okay, what what else happens up there? Yes? Um, I think here it's it's trying to impress Jesus with God, and God is like... Yeah. It's classic, like Peter, he's, he's going, oh, uh, what a, hey, I could build a little house for each of you guys. Yes, it's like, um, and just one of those moments, actually, by the way, where you realise that the gospel, the gospels are not trying to make the disciples look good. They're not making, not making stuff up to make people look good. Actually, when, the, when they're foolish or they don't know what to say, they, they report that to us. <coughs> real human beings there uh, saying real human silly things. Yes, okay, what else what else happens? There sorry, there are people they're, they're saying things that are so silly that <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, okay. That's right. It, a long time down the track people are going, oh, I remember that time Peter said that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right, that's right. Yeah. What else happens up there? Oh, that says something about Jesus. There's a word, uh, and the, the, the speaker speaks about Jesus as his son. Yeah. And this has already happened in Matthew's Gospel when Jesus was baptized. He received the Holy Spirit, and there's a voice from heaven saying similar words This is my son. Uh, and here, adding, adding that, listen to him. That is. Pay attention to what he has said to you. 
Yeah, so there is a direct endorsement uh, from God, the Father, about Jesus. Yep, and what's the, the thing in the middle, the, the, maybe the weirdest thing that happens up there? I mean, it's all pretty weird. Moses and Elijah shows up. Yes, Moses and Elijah show up. Now, it's just worth saying that uh, Moses died about 1,200 years before Jesus was born. And Elijah was around about 900 years before Jesus. So these are figures from way, way, way back in the past. And yet, here they are, standing and talking with Jesus. What's going on there? Any ideas? Are, are, they, are they random people? Are they just... Who are these people? They're part of the story of God's people. So Moses was the, p- the person who gave the people of Israel the law. Elijah was one of the prophets. Uh, they're both really significant at moments when the people of Israel are just struggling to follow God and be faithful. Um, these are people who are calling the people back to faithfulness to God. And here they are, uh, hanging out and talking with Jesus. So this is the recommendation uh, from, the, from the past, as it were. The person who gave the law, the person who was a prophet speaking for God, for God they're there with Jesus, endorsing what Jesus is doing. That this is in line with what God has done for the people of Israel in the past. Yeah. Just by the way, it's worth saying, I think, that for God, uh, Moses and Elijah are not dead. Moses and Elijah are alive to God. Uh, That God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And that people may have died in the past, like Moses, but actually for God, they're still alive. God can bring them back to life again. Uh, He can sustain them spiritually. He can raise them bodily. Yeah. Okay. So Jesus is endorsed uh, by what happens up on a mountain. And uh, we see here uh, Jesus incredibly strong. That here is Jesus in his Father's glory, uh, receiving the Father's endorsement and the endorsement of the great people of the past. Incredibly strong. Uh, and then on the way down the mountain, they get in a discussion. And uh, I think the fact that Elijah was there makes them think about, hold on, uh, Jesus has been talking about you know, things happening like God's kingdom coming. And the scribes say that, uh, the teachers of the law say that uh, Elijah has to come first before any of those things happen. And Elijah hasn't been around yet. Uh, so what's going on with that? And so they want to ask Jesus about it. And uh, so they get in a discussion about Elijah. And uh, what Jesus says to them actually is that Elijah has come. It's just that people didn't see it. And uh, hopefully Matthew tells us at the end there, then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. So how can Jesus, what what do they think is going on here? Jesus says, Elijah has already come and they realised he was talking about John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist has been an important part of Jesus' story to this point. He was the one who baptised Jesus. John was a preacher in the wilderness calling people to come back to God. And John had a distinctive look. He had his own style. And uh, he wore, it, says, it tells us, Matthew chapter 3, that he wore camel's hair, camel's hair garment. It's the latest thing. <laughs> Stinky camel hair clothing and a leather belt around his waist. Now, if you go in, uh, to a Bible concordance or you just get out your Bible, and you, uh, you ser- if you searched leather belt, guess how many times... In the Bible, it will come up twice. Only two people in the Bible are referred to as wearing leather belts. And you go back and you look, and it's Elijah. And Elijah's described, 2 Kings chapter 1, if you want to look it up, as getting around in hairy clothes 
and a leather belt. Right, so what is John doing out there in the wilderness? He is dressing like Elijah. He's doing the same thing as Elijah. He's hanging out in the wilderness, calling people to be faithful to God, even though the people there, in, uh, the official religious people, are doing the wrong thing out there in the wilderness. Crazy man John, crazy man Elijah, eating strange food, wearing strange clothes. They're, they're the same. They're the same. And for anyone who's got eyes to see it, John the Baptist is Elijah, come to get things ready for God. That's what Jesus is saying. But in the course of this discussion about Elijah and about John the Baptist, uh, Jesus says this about John the Baptist. Uh, I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognise him, but have done to him everything that they wished. And here we're just reminded of John the Baptist's story. And we need to go back in Matthew again just to remember what happened. First of all, that John was arrested because he was preaching in a way that one of the kings, King Herod, didn't like. He was locked up. He languished in prison. And eventually he was killed. He was executed by having his head chopped off. And why? Because Herod made a stupid promise. Herod made a stupid promise and John was killed and his head was served on a platter. It's one of the most horrible, evil injustices that have ever happened. That's what happened to John. And what does Jesus say? They did what they wanted with him. And it goes on in the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. John suffered this terrible weakness locked up and then executed and Jesus the son of man is going to suffer in a similar way Jesus in his weakness can you see both those things are here in this passage Jesus transformed and glorious in front of them endorsed by the voice of God and Jesus the son of man who's going to suffer and be rejected and die. An even worse and horrible fate than John the Baptist. Not beheading, but crucifixion. Well, how do we understand all that? It's astonishing. It's astonishing that the same Jesus should be so glorious and suffer in such weakness. How do we understand it? Well, I want to suggest to you that one of the key things that, uh, that we need to look at to understand it is this title that Jesus uses, Son of Man. You notice the way that Jesus uses it again and again, and he uses it both about his greatness, his glory, his strength, and about his weakness and suffering and death. Again and again, Jesus uses that term Son of Man, and if you read through Matthew's Gospel, you'll see it's both ways. It's it's with reference to both. How does that make sense? Well, this this, this word Son of Man, this title Son of Man, strictly speaking, just means human being. Just means a son of Adam. It means a guy. Just a person, a bloke. And uh, you can refer to yourself humbly this way if you're a, if you're a man. Uh, you know, this, uh, this son of man is, is uh, very humble to speak to you tonight. It's just, just be a way for me to refer to myself as a human being, right? Son of man, son of Adam. But in the Bible, there is a vision in which someone sees a son of man. It's in Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel tells us that he had a vision and he saw an extraordinary vision of God seated on the throne, described as the Ancient One. And what he saw happening was a son of man, someone who looked like a human being, coming to God and receiving all power and authority from God. A human being receiving power and authority from God. 
And this is who Jesus is. He really is a human being. He really is subject to the same weakness that we are. Liable to illness, to age, to ignorance, to suffering and death. But he is also the one human being who has received power and authority from God over all things. It's both. So in the Gospels, it is not actually that we're seeing Jesus switch into God mode, having a God moment. It's Jesus, the human being, who has received power and authority from God, his heavenly Father. We can see that here. That it's, Jesus doesn't transfigure himself. He is transfigured. He is transformed. He receives that from God. Because he is the faithful, true human being. And he can be that faithful, true human being because he is God's son. So it's not that Jesus has God moments and then human moments. He's always God. He's always human. But he is, it means that he really can be as weak as we are, enter into our situation and our condition and suffer and die as one of us on our behalf and for our sake. The weakness of Jesus is crucial in order for us to be saved. But it also means that he is the faithful one, the one who trusts God completely, is actually able to exhibit the very power of God in the things that he does. And that's how I think we should understand what's going on in the Gospels. And I want to say, uh, this is really good news. This really helps us understand the gospel more fully. The gospel is good news for us because it tells us that God has made a way for us through Jesus, his son, to belong to him forever, to be saved and rescued and forgiven from our sins, to be raised to new life, even if we die, to share God's kingdom forever. That's the good news of the gospel. God has made a way through Jesus for us to be rescued and saved. That's good news. That's good news for us. But I want to say, as, the, this good news, as we hear this good news in the story of Jesus, there's more good news going on here. Because there's good news not just for us, but there's good news about God. And here it really is about thinking about, all right, rather than thinking about Jesus having God mode, time, and human mode, we need to remember he's always fully God and always fully human. And actually what you need to do is reverse your, reverse your thinking about it. That is, when Jesus appears weak, that's when you need to think, this is God. And when Jesus appears glorious and strong, that's when you need to think, this is a human being. Okay, so let me tell you how that kind of catches out. This is good. First of all, it's good news about God. What does it show us about what God is really like? If Jesus is fully God then God is a God who serves, who humbles himself, who is willing to suffer for our sake. That is what the true God is like. And that is a God worth believing in. And that is a God worth following. And that is a God worth belonging to forever. And this is also good news about human beings. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. It means that there is a human being who is glorious and powerful. That that is what a human being can be. That the things that Jesus does are not inhuman. That that glorification of Jesus on the mountain is something that you and I could share in. Because it's something that happened to a human being. And all the things that Jesus does, this is true of. That, now, that's astonishing. That Jesus is the key to human beings being what they really can be. It's only through believing in him and trusting him and following him that we can also be like him. 
And so the gospel is actually good news about human beings. So don't ever say, I'm just human. All right? Don't ever say, I'm just human. Because actually a human being could be something extraordinarily glorious. God made us to be glorious. He crowned us with glory and honour when he made us. And through Jesus we can be what we were made to be. The gospel is good news for us. It's also good news about God and good news about human beings. Why don't we pray? If you want to ask a question, you can. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, so much for Jesus. Uh, We thank you that he is so astonishing. We thank you for what has been written down about him. Please help us to understand because we confess uh, that we really struggle to understand Jesus and what he means. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would please be with us and that we would grow in our faith and our understanding of Jesus. And by understanding him, that we might understand you, the true God, and understand ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you like to ask any questions? Yes. Last week I tried to uh, explain it in last week's talk, which I believe will turn up on the internet at some at some point. So that's probably the that's the longest. That, uh, but just briefly, uh, what we what we said was uh, to follow Jesus is to be like Jesus uh, in the sense that he chooses a path of self giving and self sacrifice for the sake of others, and that path leads. For him through death, through self-sacrifice to death, and then beyond that to resurrection and glory. And if we want to share in the resurrection and the glory, then we need to follow Jesus on that path of self-giving uh, and, and sacrificial service of others. Yeah. So I, I think it's hard to understand. It's even harder to do. Yeah. But we're going to Christian Union is about trying to do that together. So that's exactly wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, no, and look, uh, there's lots more to say about this, of course, but God the Son, part of, uh, sorry, God the Son becomes a human being. Uh, he enters into our world and he, get, he takes humanity to himself. He becomes also a human being without ceasing to be God. But in doing that, I think what Jesus is doing is, uh, what the Son of God is doing is confining himself to the limits of what a human being is. Limiting, Limiting himself to the boundaries of human being, human life. And he does that for our sake. So that he can be as one of us in our world and he can die as one of us for, for our sake, on our behalf. So, probably not everyone agrees with this, but I think this is how, how we should understand what's going on there, that Jesus voluntarily limits himself to the boundaries of human being, um, and therefore the, the, the God stuff that he does is God the Father working through him as a human being, within the limits of human being. 
Incidentally, I think that is why Jesus receives the Holy Spirit when he's baptised in order to do his ministry. Otherwise, why would Jesus need the Spirit? He needs the Spirit because human beings are weak and we need God's power at work in us to do God's work. And that, that is what Jesus does and that's what he calls us to as well. Yeah. So these things are hard to understand, but I, th- I think it's worth wrestling with uh, because it helps us actually get to know God better and get to know human beings better. All right, uh, we're going to stop there. Next week, uh, we're going to talk about why bother with Jesus, and we're going to read the rest of chapters to 17, and I have to say, you'll be astonished. <laughs> it is, my mind is still hurting from reading it this morning, and I hope you'll be here and we'll read it together, uh, and that'll be great. I'm going to hand back to Brandon.